call the meeting to, to order the data, Green Mountain Care Board Data Governance Council. Um, the first item on the agenda is for me to give a chair's report, and I have a couple of announcements, and we do have a quorum, right? Yes. Um, so the NORC, and I'm going to, what does it stand for? NORC. Yeah, NORC. We don't have to say what it stands for. Okay. It's just sure. NORC. Mm -hmm. It's like IDM. Mm -hmm. NORC. <laughs> NORC data use agreement has been approved. Um, the purpose of this DUA is to provide the cures uh, data to support uh, the federal government's CMS's evaluation of the all care model um, and to answer questions about model impact on population health outcomes, statewide spending across all payers, delivery system, and process measures, other measures of health care utilization, spending, and quality of care, and implementation of challenges and successes. They are actually going to be in Vermont over the, I think, next week. Mm -hmm. um, doing some interviews with folks, uh, so that's great. Um, so we are also at the board looking to finish up some senior level staffing and um, positions being filled. So we are, we are going to wait at least one more meeting to fill Pat Jones's old um, seat on the Green Mountain Care Board. I just wanted to give you guys that announcement. Um, I mean, sorry, on the Data Governance Council, I elevated that. <laughs> Not sure how she feels. I think she might like that. Um, and that's all I have to announce. So the next item on the agenda is to approve the April meeting minutes. So do we need a few minutes so to. Oh, okay. I read them. Second. Good. I read them too. Me too. <laughs> Okay, uh, all those in favor to approve the minutes from Tuesday, April 2nd, 2019? Aye. Aye. Okay, and aye. Okay, the minutes have been approved from last Data Governance Council meeting. All right, so the next item on the agenda is um, we're going to have our lawyers couple of our lawyers from the Green Mountain Court Board, from our staff, give us an introduction to public records laws and the interaction of the public records law with APCDs. And I think we're going to be looking at a national view, and perhaps a state view. Um, just to set this up, um, the question of APCDs and public records uh, comes up from time to time. Uh, through requests at the Green Mountain, to the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and this is also an issue that other states face with their APCDs. Um, we want to hear your feedback after Lynn and Amarin presents on um, this pretty interesting and weedy issue. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to go through this presentation and then we're going to you're both going to present together, or? We're both presenting. Okay, yes. and then we'll open it up to the council. Do you want them to ask you questions as you present, or would you, you like to? Certainly, that's fine. Okay, yeah. I think that makes sense. Yeah. Okay, I'll um, turn it over to Lynn and Amarin. Thank you. Um, you all know me. I am Lynn Combs. I am one of the Associate General Counsels of the Green Mountain Care Board. Um, and I generally advise on the data issues, which is why you see me all the time. Um, my colleague has graced us with a cameo today, which and my request, so thank you. Um, this is Erin Daly. She is uh, the other Associate General Counsel at the Green Mountain Care Board. And she also happens to be our records officer, which she can talk more about that position if it's interesting to you. But she is most certainly our expert in the office on public records issues. She, uh, prior to being with the Green Mountain Care Board, she was a diva, but she was also, uh, prior to that, at DHR, where she was their records officer for, I believe, several years, at least. Um, so she managed all of their public records requests, and prior to, she's originally from New Hampshire, I believe? Uh, but was in California for a number of years, so you actually have two California wow. attorneys here. Um, and while she was there, she was in private practice, but was advising municipal governments largely about a number of issues, but open meeting laws and public records issues there as well. So she 
that was gracious enough to come today and you guys don't have to listen to me muddle through those issues. <laughs> um, I think an overview of what we want to talk about today, um, as uh, the chair mentioned, um, this issue does come up from time to time. We all are very familiar with our DUA process and you know the analysis that we go through about whether and how to release um, claims level data in the DCRS database. Occasionally, um, we do get requests also that don't go through the DUA route, but we do get them um, via the Public Records Act, which Edward's going to talk more about. Um, so this is an issue that we do confront from time to time. It's also an issue that other states are facing. And the purpose what we wanted to do today is we kind of wanted to present the topic. It's been something we've been noodling over in the office a lot um, recently. And as Susan said, it's a really weedy issue. And so our intent and hope was that we could get your guys' feedback uh, kind of on these general principles and, and really think about it in the context of going through our data release rules. So that is part of why this has been put off, because this is an issue that we really want to think about more and have been trying to think about uh, in the contents of the data release rule that we're working on, and then also in the contents of the policies and procedures that we just passed. So we thought it would be an interesting and useful discussion, and we want to hear feedback on it. So please do ask questions as we go, or we can save them until the end, whatever. This is supposed to be a discussion. Yeah. Interactive. So we'll turn it over to Amarin with that. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you for having me. Lynn thought it might be helpful just to provide some background on the public records law, generally public records law in Vermont, and some of the basics from a fairly high level overview. But if you have more specific questions, I'm happy to answer those as we go along. So to start with, what is the idea behind the public records law? The idea behind the public records law, both from a federal level and a state level, is that we want the public to be able to obtain copies of government documents unless they uh, should be exempt from disclosure for some reason. And the purpose behind that is to create transparency within government and also allow basically the public to take a look at government decisions and see how those decisions are made. Um, most state laws that, uh, most state public records laws are based on what people call FOIA, which is the Freedom of Information Act. FOIA only applies to federal agencies, and most states have their, actually all states, have their own records law that applies to state departments and agencies. So, so this is the, um, this is where you can find the Public Records Act in Vermont statute. Uh, the Public Records Act applies to all the public agencies at all levels. Um, including, in some instances, subdivisions such as various councils or committees or commissions. Uh, so it's important to keep in mind that it's not just state government as a whole, but it's broken down even into the small components within state government. Another thing to keep in mind, which people don't often think about when making a public records request, is that public records, as they're defined by statute, are not just things in paper or electronic copies of things in paper we're talking voicemails and really any anything that's been recorded is considered to be a public record and that definition has evolved over time as our government records have evolved over time and technology has evolved. So another um, thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about the Public Records Act is that it applies only to records which the agency still possesses. So people may come to an agency and say I want to see such and such records but those records no longer exist because um, every department and agency is supposed to have a records management policy and guidelines about when they can destroy records and how long they're required to retain their records in the course of agency business. So that's just another thing to keep in mind when thinking about public records law. So the statement of policy, as I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the idea is behind it a free and open examination of records mm -hmm. and that it serves the public interest to review and criticize decisions of government. And um, along with that, there's also the need to protect in the individual right of privacy because our government is made up of individuals and peoples who live within their communities. And so there are also um, exemptions that apply to protect the privacy of individuals unless uh, the information itself is needed specifically for some reason to review the action of a government officer. And that is a pretty high threshold to meet in some instances depending on 
keep the privacy nature of the information. Having said that, if all things are equal, um, the courts have said that the policy is in favor of release of the documents. If it comes down, it could go either way. The scale of, in the courts is going to tip towards releasing those documents. So, a little bit about requesters. Anyone can request public records. It could be someone who already works within the state government. It could be uh, for an organization, individuals, people from all over the country, who would request all the time from all over the country. Um, and an important thing to note is that when reviewing a records request, you can't look at the motive behind why someone is requesting it. You may know that they are actually trying to disrupt government operations. They're trying to cripple an agency just because they can. Right? There have been instances where people have made public records requests for, I want every document that has the word water on it. And the purpose is just purely to disrupt operations. So that's probably an extreme example, and there are ways to deal with those types of requests. But generally speaking, the idea is that you're not going to make a determination based on who the person is and why they're asking for it in deciding whether to release the document. In terms of process, the agency must produce the requested record promptly, which by statute is three business days. There are certain circumstances when that is extended to 10 business days. I won't go into that level um, of detail <coughs> right now, but the, uh, it's important to know we do get a lot of requests sometimes where the request is not clear exactly what records the person is looking for. We um, are allowed by statute to go and ask for clarification. Say, I think you're requesting this, but I'm not sure. Could you confirm this or you say this, but maybe you're only interested in a certain number of years. It would be hugely burdensome for us to go back and try and get everything that's happened over the last 10 years that might be responsive to this request. Are you really interested in the last 10 years or are you looking for the last three or the last six months? And a lot of times people are looking for something much smaller than what we have. And so we use uh, follow-ups, seeking clarification as a tool to limit the burden on us in producing documents and also to limit the burden on the person who requests information and then receives a huge pile when really they were only interested in a small amount of information. <coughs> so as part of the records law, uh, individuals are allowed to inspect or receive a copy of the record. Inspection does not happen as much these days, given uh, how easy it is to email documents. So it's usually, it's usually copies of records. Um, there are some fees associated with that, which I'm not going to get into today unless anyone's interested. Uh, and then it is also important to note that <clears throat> there is a series of exemptions where the agency can withhold the record in its entirety, or where appropriate, might redact information that is exempt, <clears throat> but there's still remaining information within the document that you can produce. Two, uh, two questions in the last slide. Yes. <coughs> so for the third bullet, is uh, that uh, an option on the part of the agency? They could, if there is exempt uh, material in the document, they can withhold the entire document, or do they just have to uh, redact the exempt information and provide the rest of the document? Uh, the latter. If the information is segregable, if you can segregate the, the exempt information from the other information, then you're required to do so. Um, having said that, if by segregating the information the document becomes useless, then you are not required to do that. Those are, I mean, the circumstances where that would happen are pretty small, but there is, if you end up redacting 95% of the document, all you're left with is the headers and the page numbers, then there is no point in producing that document. Um, but in general, you're required to redact, if you can, redact information and produce what is not exempt. And secondly, most of you probably uh, can't remember pre-email days, but in the pre-email days, um, people could try to avoid having to pay for the record um, by coming in and inspecting it first and then just saying, this is what I want. Um, where where have things evolved in terms of paying for records that are uh, electronically uh, transferred? So that is, that is still the case. There are still some circumstances where I think people come in and choose to inspect rather than pay for the copies. However, because Vermont allows agencies to charge for staff time in making the documents available, 
there is still that as a lever that usually prevents abuse, like just pure abuses of coming to inspect. It takes us, you know, 18 days to put together the documents and they say, well, we're, we're just inspecting, so you can't charge us. There's, um, there have been some cases in Vermont more recently where people have started to challenge mm -hmm. um, the idea that in, to inspect, it, it should be free inspection. Um, and it, I would say, just remains sort of an evolving landscape there that we deal with from time to time. I mean, in, uh, saying that the requester were saying that they should be able to inspect for free. Mm -hmm. I think there was a just on the third bullet, agency can withhold or must withhold an exempt record? Mm -hmm. um, so it depends, right? If you are required to, if you're required to keep information confidential for some other reason, like HIPAA, such, HIPAA. such as HIPAA, such as other <coughs> federal regulations, um, like by court order, I mean, there are yep. a lot of circumstances where, so if there is something else saying you absolutely can't release this, then you can't. Um, but so that's why we say can because there may be circumstances where the only thing that says you um, don't need to release it is one of the public records law exemptions. I find that to be less common than pe than the argument that or the statutory provision that says that the agency is not required to create a public record. I find that people push back more on that asking. I know you don't have to. You know, create a public record, but will you because of the following reasons of why I'm asking for the information. So you don't usually see that that as much, but yeah, technically, unless there's another law that prevents you from disclosing it, you have the option of exercising the exemptions. And whose option is that? The it's the agency. Agency, secretary, or? It would be the, the department then. Yeah. Whoever the, the records custodian is, which is typically the head of the department or agency. So moving to exemptions, uh, in Vermont there are 40 exemptions in the statute, this is a lot. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't, that the scope of exemptions under federal law isn't that broad, but they put it into much smaller buckets. I think it's seven that are used commonly, maybe two more that are used in very limited circumstances, but in Vermont we lay a whole bunch. And then in addition to that, um, there are a lot of Vermont statutes that specifically exempt um, categories of documents from inspection and copying under the public records law. And then, of course, there are other laws that would prohibit you from um, obtaining those records under federal law or yeah. So these are some examples um, of exemptions under statutes. I won't probably go into them. I will say that when we say confidential under law, it's actually designated by law as confidential or similar term. So you don't even actually need to, the law doesn't need to say this is confidential. It can be something that is similar term. They don't define similar term, but um, it is interesting that it's in there in case someone, for example, when making a statute, forgot to say, we're designating this information as confidential, but it's clear from the text mm -hmm. of the document that they intend this to be confidential. So, and this is um, some of the things that I was just mentioning in responding to Tom. Um, we're required to redact and produce rough, the non exempt portions of the records if they can be uh, segregated. And then, just in case someone is uh, does not agree with our reasons for withholding documents, they can they have to appeal to the department head before they can appeal this in court. So if they were to appeal it to the department head, then we would have five business days to respond to that. Yeah, I was going to say I should give the caveat that I wrote these slides, so all the mistakes I'm going to show you. So <laughs> not first. I didn't see any mistakes. <laughs> well, I was realizing when you were talking though, that there is an omission. Can you speak a little bit more about the difference between? we have to give records that already exist, but we are required to make a record, because I think that's probably relevant to our discussion, too. Um, sure, just uh, as part of the public records law, 
the agency is not required to create a public record. They're only required to produce those records that are already in existence. There has been a lot of conversation in recent history about what is the creation of a public record in the age of electronic records. And the public records law is specific about what is a standard format for a record and what is a non-standard format. Because a non-standard format is created, <coughs> but providing something in a standard format is not. So if you have, for example, a, um, a PDF document providing a printout of that document would be a standard format. You can't say it's in PDF, but to give it to you, you would have to, uh, you would have to print it out for you to inspect. Therefore, it's creating a public record, which we're not required to do. So you can't have it. So we can't, we can't do that. So the the records law itself is specific in terms of how you deal with some electronic records um, and what's considered creating a record and not creating a record. And I think this is an area that will continue to. Um, be examined over time as the types of electronic records come into existence as we start doing things like archiving emails into different formats where you need to open them within a specific program. Um, you may need to redact information which may require you to put it into a different format or you put it into the format that someone can do. And so there becomes more and more layers of how you get the document from where it is to a point where someone can view it. This hasn't been something that's been um, that litigated in Vermont. I'm sure that there are uh, states that have more extensive litigation on this, probably California. Uh, they have a lot of records and a lot of people, a lot of litigation. So uh, there are certainly states I think that we can look to to look for guidance on those issues, but Vermont itself has not tackled a lot of those issues at this time. Related to that, I, I, maybe you could speak to the definition of a public record. I deal with that a lot in my day to day, that all that we do are public records and there are exemptions to the release of that, but that the idea of some things are public records and some aren't is, some, is a misconception I encounter a lot in my day to day. Um, but I, I think so the creation of a public record means the creation of a different form of the same um, information in the example you just used from here you right. Mm -hmm. um, That's one example of creating a record. It could also be that you're asking someone to take, um, I'm trying to think of an easy example, where rather than, I don't want the 100 documents that show me all this information, I would like you to provide me with a summary. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. mm -hmm. That is a very common one. It's like, oh, I don't want to thank you, but I don't want to go through a thousand records on this. Could you just give me a summary of it? And um, and so that is, you know, some of those circumstances where the agency may decide, you know what, it is easier for us to provide you with a summary and create a record rather than us go pull those 1,000 documents and do redactions and things like that. So, um, but to your point, I think, uh, and I don't think we have the specific, we do have the statutory language. Exactly. Oh, yes, we do. Okay. Um, yeah, so records produced or acquired in the course of public agency business. It's very, very broad. It really is. I think um, there, are, uh, I, agree, I agree that I've also encountered um, some misconceptions about what is a public record versus what is just public. Um, people say, well, it's not a public record because it's not public. And it's, that's not what we mean when we say a public record. We just mean that it's a, a record used by a public agency. And I have another thought related to that. Um, uh, I think another misconception that I found about public records is that um, that the agency uh, <clears throat> that then I, I mentioned this earlier actually I think that sometimes people think well I don't tell me why I have to give you the document and it's not tell me why but that and that's not it it's uh, I have to show you why I can't give you the document, right? right? So it's in favor of people yeah. receiving the document. Um, and that's sometimes in this case. And in terms of um, destruction of public records, mm -hmm. does every agency get to set their own retention policy? 
<clears throat> yes and no, every agency is required to have one, but it is reviewed by the Vermont State Archives and Records. Administration, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, Vasara. So uh, agencies and departments work with Vasara, and it has to be approved by Vasara, both the schedule and the policy. And beyond happy, you can answer those questions. <laughs> I can do it, but so glad questions. you're here. <laughs> Um, I was just going to say, too, before we move into the other half of this presentation, uh, one another example that I routinely dealt with in my past life in doing civil litigation is backup tapes and other ways that um, organizations retain their electronic information for disaster recovery purposes. Um, we would get these questions in discovery a lot, like the plaintiffs would say, well, if you don't have this on your email system, why can't you go to the backup tapes? And I don't know all the technicalities of it. But I know it is extremely difficult and extremely expensive to recover information from backup tapes and things like that because it really is just intended for, you know, there's a massive earthquake and the building where all of your data, your server is housed, is gone. So um, it's, it, those kinds of interactions happen a lot in civil litigation too. So I suspect that it's probably something that's relevant to here as well. And you're talking about what you can do for information. Yep, I think that's true. I also find that um, sometimes it has been important for me to remind people that just because our records retention schedule says the document was due to be destroyed two years ago, that I actually need to have them confirm that it wasn't that destroyed. Uh, sometimes boxes just get put in a, in a line and they're waiting uh, for their turn to be destroyed and so you are still required to produce that record even if the record retention schedule says it should have been destroyed two years ago. The fact is, it wasn't, and we still have it. <laughs> so you need to produce it. Um, and I think, to Lynn's point, uh, I think as different modes of storing information continue to evolve, there's going to be more conversations about the cost to the agency to have to produce some of the records that are stored in a way that is expensive. Um, because you know, the cost schedule I, that is currently in place, I don't know fully addresses some of those scenarios where it is extremely expensive to pull information out um, of where it's being stored. And, and, and I think for the time being, the intent is that agencies and departments you know, may be footing the bill until the, the laws catch up with technology. Yeah, it just seems kind of like a paradox to say that uh, we're retaining these public records and therefore they're theoretically available for review, public review, but it's too expensive to make them available. You know, like why have a why have a retention policy that allows you to store them in a manner that makes them unretrievable except at great expense. You know, so mm -hmm. I, I that's more of a policy decision, but just I guess it's weighing the, the potential need to retrieve versus the cost of mm -hmm. having it available. Yep, that's a good point. Any other questions? You could have more later. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I won't, I won't, I won't leave yet. <laughs> um, so moving on to the next piece of this, um, I'm not going to do an overview of the ABCDs. I think everybody here is generally familiar with the concept. Ours, of course, is eCures, and we also have a BUDS database that we talk about here a lot. Um, overall, uh, like I said, when we start looking into this issue, we were very curious about how other states handle this, too, because it is an issue in other states. As Amarin said, all 50 states have public record laws. We are now up to more than 20 states that have APCD legislation. I, mean, I was trying to count on the APCD Council website, and it looks like we're approaching 30 states with legislation. Not all of them have actual operative databases yet, um, but it is definitely something that states are talking about and doing. Um, as we all, I think we, this is kind of a concept we're familiar with, but States take varied approaches to data collection and release in terms of um, respecting privacy and protecting privacy and uh, those kinds of issues. And a lot of that is tailored to what the purpose of their APCD is. Um, as we're going to talk about in a minute, it, it, the purposes actually vary pretty greatly 
um, from states, and a lot of that is put into the statute. You know, ours is kind of very broad in terms of like understanding healthcare costs and doing the work that the Green Mountain Care Board does um, and looking at our healthcare system. Um, there are other states, Minnesota is one that comes to mind, that are really very specific in terms of the things that you're supposed to use the APCD for. Um, so that is definitely uh, varied. Uh, I think one of the ways, in terms of collecting the data, one way that states um, approach it is they will only collect limited data sets. So from the get-go, they will not collect certain information from the submitters. Um, one that we use currently is the collection of de-identified data sets. Um, meaning that the information in the data set is somehow coded so that the individual's identity is not easily under like known or discerned from the data. I want to do a little caveat there too because I tend to use some of these terms interchangeably. There's de-identified in the general sense meaning that you can't identify who the person is from looking at the piece of data. HIPAA uses the term de-identified as a term of art um, under HIPAA requirements, there are two ways to officially de-identify information. One is to go through a pretty complex process that an expert does um, to de-identify the way that a lot of organizations who don't go the expert route do is the HIPAA safe harbor provision. And there are 18 um, uh, identifiers of information that are listed, date of birth, name, um, any date beyond the year. Uh, is another one. Um, there's some requirements about zip codes, email address, those kinds of things. And the de-identified for safe harbor purposes means all of that information is removed from the data set. Um, so just to clarify that. Uh, in terms, uh, they also can place st strict parameters on how live identifiers are correct collected, meaning things that can readily identify an individual. So name is a good example of one, address is another. Um, in terms of release, sometimes states will not allow the release of their APC data, or they will only allow it to be released to state entities. I'll talk about this later, but Minnesota is one that comes to mind on that because they actually have their collection for their APCD, and when it was originally enacted, they collected it, and it was intended to be used for one purpose, and I can't off the top of my head remember what that was. Um, and the only people who were allowed to access the data was the Minnesota Department of Health, only for that purpose. And they broadened it a little bit. There are now five or six purposes for which the Minnesota Department of Health is allowed to access the APCD data, APCD data but they do not release it beyond that. So Minnesota is probably the strictest on this. And also in terms of releasing information, sometimes states will just go with reports and analysis of the data. Uh, that's Minnesota is falling into that category. Like they will release the reports that they do pursuant to the like six purposes for looking at the data, but nothing more than that. Um, and the other thing before we go further, I just want to clarify, um, we're talking here about claims level data. So your individual claim file for a particular visit to a healthcare provider that gets submitted from your insurer. We're not talking about analyses. We're not talking about the reports that the Green Mountain Care Board is doing. We're not talking about those kinds of things. This is just specifically the individual claim that shows up in the VCARES database. Um, so uh, that's just worth keeping in mind as we go forward. Just one quick question. Yeah. Do you know, are there any states that don't have legislation but that do have an APCD? You know, I was wondering about that. I don't think there are. I think they all are enacted by legislation, but I think there could be a situation. I know th there are states that have private entities that it, they contracted with mm -hmm. to manage their APCDs, but my suspicion is they still have a statute yeah. that creates it. It would have to be private because if there's, there's probably there's needed weird. legislation for my APCD. Yeah. I, I don't Do you know, I know of a state that has an APCD that doesn't have a statute that enables it, but there are some states that have a state APCD and a private APCD, oh, and there may be some nuance there. Yeah, and I, a lot of it too is state regulation in terms of requiring insurers to submit to it. Yeah. So that piece of it has to come in at some level in terms of mandating that people submit the data to the APCD. Um, subject to Gobe, of course. <laughs> Put that caveat in there. Um, generally speaking, uh, like I said, it's state-specific laws and regulations that usually govern the release. 
most states that release data are guided by the HIPAA safe harbor provisions, the you know the HIPAA sanction delay process, those kinds of things, um, or they have a similar state requirement. It may not necessarily be expressly HIPAA, but they have similar state requirements. Um, I love this lovely graphic that I found. This is actually from a couple of years ago, a publication from a couple of years ago. But as I think we all know, and this is kind of our policy too, that the more specific the information gets about an individual, the more heightened the protection we want to include on it is. So that's that's usually the philosophy. Um, this is again from that same publication. So thank you. I hope I appropriately credited it. This is from two years ago and actually did not include Vermont. Um, but it, uh, it it's information that just I thought gave a good overview in terms of examples of how states protect their data, um, in terms of the ways in which you're allowed to release it, the data you're allowed to release, the people who are allowed to get access to it, and then also pricing, probably less relevant to this conversation. Um, and I'm pretty sure I went through and did everything that Vermont does, tried to make it make it look uh, so it's somewhat readable. Um, and I would also say. I, Sarah and Kate have any objections to any of those. I did not run this by them first, so they might <laughs> correct some of that. Um, moving on to the next slide. In our research, there is actually model legislation. I know this is a term we use a lot in the legal world, um, and I don't know, if so apologies if this is something you guys already know, but oftentimes the organizations or lawyers or committees or whatever will get together and put best practices in terms of like here's what we would recommend you include in your legislation about this or here's what we would they do it for contracts they do it for all kinds of things but in this case there was actually a model statute that was put together um, by uh, NATO and the APCD council and I believe the University of New Hampshire was also involved um, this is their recommendation uh, on the statutory language the, fir the first section they recommend making sure that a statute includes language that says the healthcare information collected and maintained by the APCD program shall be considered confidential and exempt from disclosure by law. Um, they also go through a, bunch, a policy discussion in the, the accompanying discussion that they include with the legislation. So obviously they say, you know, tweak it to what's appropriate to your state and what's appropriate to your APCD purposes, but they do acknowledge um, and recommend that it is important to specifically identify this information as being confidential and perhaps not information that you would normally go um, through a route of releasing um, where somebody, you know, where you don't have to do more analysis about the purpose of the request. Um, then our, we also have done some general communicating with these organizations um, and they have re about what their recommendations are, what they are seeing in terms of this. The recommendation from NATO uh, and from APCD Council was that authorizing legislation should include some kind of language exempting the collected data from public records requests. Um, something in there acknowledging, something in there talking about uh, that this is a particular special kind of data that's being collected. So other states that have done this, Utah has language in there that says um, the information report statements and other data received by the committee, the committee is the entity that manages the APCD, are strictly confidential and that the use of publication shall uh, be done in a way that no person is identifiable. Um, so they kind of give the heightened terminology of strictly confidential to the information. Um, and California's route, their statute says that individual patient level, level data shall be exempted from the disclosure requirements of the California Public Records Act. So they specifically exempt the data um, from disclosure under the Public Records Act. Rhode Island takes a slightly different approach. And interestingly, Rhode Island's uh, law is done by regulation, so it's akin to the rules that we are offering rather than going the statutory route. Um, the Rhode Island law is the data sets and other information submitted and maintained in the database, so their APCD, shall not be a public record, and no disclosure of any of the data sets or health information shall be made unless specifically authorized. So they specifically exempt their data, say that it's not a public record, even though it's being collected by and submitted to a government agency and used for government agency work. 
Um, and uh, I guess that's about what Rhode Island is. And then I think as we discussed with Rhode Island, their statute is extremely strict and that it only the only people who are allowed to have access to the data are the Minnesota Department of Health, who are the custodians of the database. Um, moving forward, I'm kind of flying through this because uh, I want to make sure we have time for discussion. Um, but I think generally the route states tend to be taking kind of fall into three buckets. Um, one is the Rhode Island bucket, which is the information in this database, the claims level information is not a public record. Um, uh, I think more states are going with the California route, which is it may be a public record, not really saying one way or the other, but it's expressly exempt from disclosure. Um, and then I, I guess I should say more states are going with um, language that talks about heightened protection for the information um, and perhaps talks gives guidance as to how it should be released but does not specifically um, call out or identify any interaction with state public records laws. And it seems to me that the Utah law is more restrictive than California. So California is basically talking about an individual record, um, whereas Utah has this phrase that the information shall um, be done, uh, publication of the information shall be done in such a way that no person is identifiable so that you can have a record uh, um, that if, 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 if somebody can kind of manipulate data around it to extract that, that record or to identify that record, that seems a more restrictive approach in California, which is specific to the record. You know, that's interesting because I think I could see it both ways. My reading and feel, water, so. <laughs> feel free to weigh in on this, Amarin, too. But my reading of California is, you know, we've talked about, and we talked about it in Vermont context, but I think the principle is the same about redaction versus, um, you know, just withholding the record entirely. And I think for California, the way I would read the statute is you may be able to make a request under the statute, but you cannot have the information period the entirety of these records is exempt. I think I would read this in a way, and certainly the APCD Council reads this as something, reads this as not being, as being exempt under the Public Records Act. I think there's a way to make an argument more that obviously they want heightened protection, they're intending that the information be, um, not be available to the public, the privacy of the individuals is very important, but you know, I think there may be more wiggle room to argue about what strictly confidential means. And then I also think in reading, I will say I think in reading in a, that in a way that no person is identifiable, I think that's pretty strong language um, because it's not just there aren't direct identifiers in there, it's that like I would read that as if you link this to another database you still can't identify people. So that seems to me to be a pretty strong standard. So I would say both, I would look at it in both ways. I don't know if you have anything to add on that. Um, I would say that whenever looking at the statutory provisions that govern, govern one of these databases, that you want to look at it in concert with what their public records law is. Mm -hmm. The public records law and how they're formatted and structured do differ from state to state. So it could be that Utah has um, an exemption that says anything designated as strictly confidential yeah. cannot be released mm -hmm. under the public records law. It, that could be one of their exemptions, whereas the second sentence of that um, talking about in such a way that no person is identifiable actually also has to do with how the database, in other circumstances outside of the public records law, how that data and how those reports are used. So I guess that would just be my, my input is that whenever you're looking at a statute governing the database, you need to look at it in concert with what the public records law is. Um, going to Vermont, um, like I said, the purpose of this is we really do want to have a general philosophical policy discussion here, but I figured after going through all of this, it would probably be unfair to not at least allow some of my in Vermont. <laughs> um, in the statute, uh, the, the Enabling Act that created VCURES um, actually does talk about the collection, storage, and release of data. Um, and the statute specifically says the collection, storage, and release of healthcare data that are subject to federal requirements of the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act um, shall be governed exclusively by 
HIPAA and the related regulations. Um, so in looking at that statute entirely, based on the language that the release shall be governed exclusively by HIPAA, um, it appears that the legislative intent behind the statute was to uh, direct that the board, the custodian of the records, uh, review the data and the, whether or not it's acceptable to release the data based on HIPAA as opposed to reviewing it under the Public Records Act. So that's certainly the way the language goes um, in the statute. There are also other places in the statute that talk about the heightened confidentiality of the information um, and uh, you know, allowing the board to enact rules and regulations like our DUA process, like our policies and procedures that would also govern how data is released. Um, I don't know if there's anything else you want to add in about our particular statute. I most of that. Um, but that's certainly the reading is that the legislative intent was that HIPAA is what dictates the release of the data as opposed to the Public Records Act. I have to say now in true lawyer arguments, this is something lawyers do, and I think a lot of other people roll their eyes, we have to take the second approach, which is even if it were governed by the Public Records Act, which we don't think it is, um, even if it were governed by the Public Records Act, there are a whole bunch of exemptions that would apply to this data. And again, we're just talking about the individual claims files. We're not talking about like analysis that gets done or something more broad. This is just like the individual events. Um, so I, I again, won't read through all of these, but it's a long list. And these, I think this is probably not an exhaustive list. There are probably other examples too that we have um, would, could come across and, and look to. I will note specifically as far as VCURES goes, we have um, a data use agreement with the federal government that also restrict, strictly governs how we can release me Medicare data. Um, a lot of that is related to the Federal Privacy Act. Um, and we also have a memorandum <coughs> of understanding, I believe, with uh, DEMA as far as Medicaid data goes that places similar restrictions on how we can release the data. So those are two other things that really um, uh, govern and apply and how we think through releasing information. So I think at this point, unless there are specific questions, I think we'd like to open it up to discussion. I think, at least from my reading of it, the Public Records Act laws are not really a clean fit when we come to talk about um, releasing data from our APCDs for a whole bunch of reasons. I think technology is one reason. So when we're talking about creating records, or we're talking about the expense of compiling records and those kinds of things, uh, those things come up. And obviously the, the Public Records Act analysis is very different than our DEA process and analysis. So I think those, at the end of that, those would be the comments that I would make. And I think questions, obviously, we're happy to respond to. And more yeah. importantly, I'm like, I would like to hear feedback. Yeah, do you, does the council have enough framework here to just, and I think Lynn said it, really an open discussion around policy and then um, direct questions as they come up. We are, we really want to hear from us, <laughs> you, um, as we look to, um, you know, let's, let's see what the discussion yields, but, you know, one question is, do we need to change our statute? I mean, these are the types of things that we'd like to hear from, so. The only other thing I would say too is, as we've been noodling on this and I've been thinking about this, I obviously have been thinking about it as a lawyer for the Green Mountain Care Board. I also think about it as somebody who has a record in this database. So that's mm -hmm. the other piece of it too, is like I have health information in this database about my medical treatment. So that's kind of the other context that I want to lay on the table when, when talking about further. So another, just a little bit up. Do you want me to call? Do you want to, why don't we start, do you want to start, Kathy? That way we can. <laughs> yeah, now she's on the spot. Um, if you don't, we can go to talk. <laughs> um, you know, just, yeah, so much to consider. Um, and, you know, I'll, like you, Lynn, you know, what's, what's in the system that I, as a person, would not want disclosed. Um, I can recall a circumstance back related to patient safety incidents where the Joint Commission wanted, you know, information that they kept saying, oh, it's not patient level, it's not patient level, but we want the date, the time, mm -hmm. and the place. And I'm like, Ugh. in a teeny tiny hospital, 
Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like we yeah. know, yeah. we could know who that person was that that happened to. So even though it may just be dates, I think there are still some nuance that has to be considered. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, uh, for me as tax commissioner, I uh, had to deal with these confidentiality issues a lot. But, um, you know, I would uh, did actually did get a phone call from the fifth floor once asking about a case, and I couldn't even admit to the fifth floor that there was a taxpayer. <laughs> so, you know, some yep. bad got around, and I just said, I, I can't, uh, I can't tell you, and uh, uh, the funny response was, it was obviously somebody uh, powerful in Vermont, which I can tell you who it is because it went to the Supreme Court and the oh. public record now, <laughs> but um, it had to do with TD Bank North and, and our suit against them, and, uh, and uh, this is in the governor's uh, book as he left. Uh, so the word came back to me, well, if you can't tell us what's going on, you better win. <laughs> and it was just, uh, but you know, it's it's like uh, um, uh, John Henry, Martin Henry used to be in Callis. There, there was, um, I was on the Callis school board, and we used to every year before the budget process, mm -hmm. kind of look at the tax department data to say how's Callis doing, mm -hmm. and um, as kind of a backdrop. And uh, the uh, there was a. a a Texan that lived up on the hill above Mabel Corner, yeah. um, who was yeah. a millionaire, and he paid taxes in Vermont. Um, and so every year you could see him until he moved to Texas, and then there was this big hole. Because <laughs> <laughs> there was only one of those, you know. And so at the tax department, I think that we had a five identifier limit, um, and you're at 11. I think from our discussions, but yes. but it it is a continuum, and I bet you there's somebody out there that even mm -hmm. with the eleven constraint could figure something out if they wanted to. Yep. And uh, what what is what is the liability of the state? Uh, do we have a absolute um, uh, requirement to protect somebody's identity under all circumstances, or is it is there a point where we've done due diligence the best we can and um, Beyond that, if someone figures out how to untrap the mousetrap, then more power to them. Well, that's why we have a data governance council, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really glad she can say that's why we have fingers. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, I mean, well, and I so that's would why add that um, in addition, um, there are conditions for release where people or entities that we're releasing these, you know, claims of data to. Um, are agreeing that, that they're not going to attempt to re-identify, that they're not going to publish any um, information or data that could be identifiable. You know, that there's there's a whole host of conditions that they have to attest to um, before they're able to have access to the data. Yeah, so that's, I mean, I think from my perspective in terms of this, I think we have a statutory mandate to use the data and to share the data in a responsible and ethical manner. Um, so I think we do have to use the data, and I do think the legislature contemplated that others, perhaps outside of the Green Mountain Care Board and outside of the state government, would be using data as well. Um, I think that in terms of absolute requirement and the law we would call that strict liability so there's no question about what, what your intent was it doesn't matter um, I think that would probably be inconsistent uh, with our statutory mandate to say that it imposed an absolute liability on us um, but it, I it does impose an absolute liability. no I think it's inconsistent with the mandate that we share the data because particularly in Vermont it is virtually impossible to share this kind of data and if you put a little bit of effort into it not have it be able to be re-identified, at least in certain situations. Um, so I think the question then comes in to Susan's point about having a data governance council and, and the people that govern this data in our office and um, as far as BUDS goes, also in the Department of Health, um, we have to do our best efforts um, to protect the information and be responsible with the information. And I think that's what our directive is in terms of our what we have to do. And I think that 
we look at, um, you know, obviously how we collect the information, how it is stored, but I specifically think about our DUA process, and I specifically think about, you know, the rule that we're working on for data release. I think about um, the policies and procedures that we've just finalized, and I think those collectively are the things that we are doing to try to be responsible data students. And there's a balance. And there's certainly a balance. You want to be able to use that. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, it is a powerful piece of information. There are certainly limitations to it, but this data is, it's a power, it has a lot of information in there that could inform a lot of stuff that's going on. Um, so it is a balance. Um, but I think, I would say, my reading at least, is our obligation is to figure out what that balance is, you know, which is obviously an easy question, <laughs> um, and, and do our best to maintain that in a way that is responsible. Again, Kathy's point, I try to think about it sometimes in a how do I feel about my data in that database. Like, what happens if it's my claim that somebody's trying to re-identify? And that's kind of what guides me usually. That's a security, and that's what it says in our policies. You guys feel free to weigh in more on that if you have other thoughts. And if, if, if things do go wrong, are you aware of any lawsuits brought by uh, individuals or the ACLU because of a breach? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say a breach, but um, the case that kind of came up a few nights is it's a lower Vermont court, but um, where uh, the Department of Education was sued, or the Agency of Education was sued over some records related to suspensions. Um, a lot of the fact pattern is a bit different, but um, what scared me about it is um, I think the legal conception of a database in that finding made it sound like a file cabinet and it was just trivial to like uh, pull out the information you needed and, uh, and produce it where, um, you know, in a, in a complex large database like ours, that, that's just not true. So, um, yeah, certainly lots of cases brought related to Public Records Act. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know how many, I don't know of any related to <coughs> data assets specifically, but I've kind of been waiting for, for a test case. Um, or any yeah. cases where a, you know, a, a person's medical information was leaked or you know, even inadvertently disclosed and yeah. the, the patient brought suit? Yeah, so that's like actually that? happened not in the context of APCDs. I think that the APC Council would know if there had been a lawsuit somewhere else, I would suspect. Yeah, and I think, it, I think it's also worth, like, just level setting yeah. that the, we, every piece of data that we have is de-identified. And what we're talking about here is somebody who could cobble together. Like, there's always the example of dual score where there's, like, Mm -hmm. Very few people, and you know, and like something like what Kathy was saying. So I think that just I just want to say, you know, we're not. I would we're just want to clarify the de-identification. De so the data that we get is de-identified in the general sense. It is not de-identified to HIPAA's safe harbor standard. So that would be one caveat. So the data that's maintained in the cures, you can't see who the person like it doesn't have the person's name, and I think there's some other direct identifiers excluded. But it's not, it does not, like, just pulling the data from BQRs is not de-identified to HIPAA safe harbor standards. So that's which is yeah. a lot of clarification I want to make. Did you have another one? I don't think so, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, it's... And, and I guess another question is, have, have, have you ever had to, um, I don't know, retract data you know, from somebody who had, you'd given... Yeah data permission to use, and then they misused it. Uh, yeah, there were any violations. I think that's largely due to our rather stringent standards historically for its release. Um, so that, you know, it's largely been research academic institutions. So I think that's another reason why this is poignant as we think about expanding its use um, and just, you know, to how to be, continue to manage that balance through that process. Mm -hmm. And we also do follow up, too, in terms of, like, you know, okay, your data use agreement has expired. You guys send the data back to us or destroy it, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And attest those kind of destruction, yeah. Yeah, and attest to those. So we actually also actively are proactive about keeping in touch with our people that didn't have data use agreements, too. So that's another thing that I think we do. Um, uh, to your point, though, about patients suing, that actually happens a lot in terms of HIPAA, mm -hmm. like healthcare entities that have. Um, 
patient data. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever been subject to a notification from a, one of your healthcare providers that says that your data was accessed. So that's under HIPAA, those healthcare providers are required to notify somebody when that happens. And there are lawsuits and companies get fined both and they, they are subject to liability to the patient, but also um, you know, the, the government can go in and find healthcare institutions because the government can go in and look at audits and those kinds of things. So in the context of enforcing HIPAA, yeah, it does happen. And um, the DUS um, restrictions or, or requirements related to if there's a breach, um, and I think we had one that wasn't really a breach reported, um, right? Remember the Brian Martin Friday afternoon? <laughs> <laughs> But it wasn't, it didn't it actually, yeah, it didn't end up being a breach, but it was. Oh, uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, you know, enough to raise palpitations. Yeah. <laughs> All right, I'm sorry. Sarah, I, I meant to mention down. earlier, yeah. Sarah has a 350 call. So thanks, guys. Thanks for being here. It sounds welcome. So, should we keep going? Uh, if people, I would love to hear more comments. If people um, I. Was very, I was listening for what, are, what is the action here? What's yeah. the vulnerability yeah. that we're um, talking about? I feel like the statute covers it in some ways, but wondering how onerous it, are the public record requests that are being fielded by the board um, for release through that means? And then um, I loved the triangle and the arrows of how can we get to, what are the actions that we need to take to make sure that we can release public use files and be more transparent while still going back to our first priority of protecting um, people's privacy in that along the lines that has been discussed. So um, Kate can chime in on this too. I think in terms of public use files, particularly with VCARES data, I think it is a long-term hope that we will get something in the form of analytic files that are generally being produced by the board um, that can be accessed perhaps more easily with the <coughs> DUA analysis that we do, or maybe it would be less strict DUA. Am I looking to you now to make yes. sure I'm going along with this? <laughs> um, generally, when um, members of the public are looking for APCD data um, under you know, a Public Records Act request, it's because they want to answer a question, and we're, we're hoping and anticipating that um, we will be able to establish a set of analytic files that, that can um, answer a, a broad a spectrum of questions um, to, to to resolve that for um, the public generally, um, and and that I will say that's easier to use. It's easier to navigate. Um, I think that what um, most of us um, tend to fail to understand is how complex the VCARES database really is, and how hard it is to to navigate, and and how. Um, how challenging it would be, even if it were to be released to you, um, right? To get anything from it, um, we don't we don't get a lot of requests through the Public Records Act, but we do sometimes from call. time yeah. to time. Um, sometimes we're able to um, address the the questions um, either um, by saying it's a lot more complex than you think mm -hmm. it is. Um, Sometimes by saying we actually have created um, an analytic file that might answer your question, or um, you know, or, or that sort of thing. Um, but w or you can access the data through a data use agreement, and here's the way in which um, you know here's the process that you would follow, and here are the reasons why um, we have that in place um, for you know availability and release, but also for confidentiality protection. Um, so, but. But in the course of you know navigating through um, records requests that come in from time to time, and looking at the um, you know coming up in um, revising the data release rule, it occurs to us that the statute is is clear enough for us to be able to say we have you know a certain number of exemptions, but it does it's not as explicit as the model legislation that's provided to us by um, the national organizations that support APCDs. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as Lynn did the research in how other states address it, there are other approaches that, that we might consider. And we might not consider changing statute, but, yeah. you know, we, we've opened up the, 
um, the rule revision, maybe there's an opportunity there. That's what I was thinking. I mean, yeah. It does happen like the time to time that we do that and the director's request to the director to do And I guess from my perspective and thinking about this, <coughs> like I had mentioned previously that there are a lot of reasons why the APC context does not fit cleanly mm -hmm. into the public records release analysis. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the complexity of the data and expertise that you need to have to actually use and understand the raw data in that database is one. I think that the fact that the public records analysis specifically states that you do not look at who is requesting the data and the intent of the data, I think that's inconsistent with the policies yeah. and procedures we have been really thinking about and trying to ensure and enforce. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's also inconsistent to a certain extent with patient privacy protections. Because the other like touchstone that I think about this in terms of the analogy that I make on the personal level is that like we don't have state with county hospitals here, but in San Francisco, San Francisco General Hospital is the county hospital. It is run by the county. I'm not sure that I'm comfortable with the concept of somebody being able to go in and ask for the billing information. My, you know, my billing right. records there, and they're going to redact my name and they're going to redact the date of birth. But like, it's not information that is conceptually something that we think other people should have access to. It's almost um, the incongruence of the Public Records Act to the policies that we built in the DA and release of the data that we've built around each other. That's, that's what I'm, this has been great. This has been super helpful. I, I don't know if that sure. gives you a, a, an action, like our, what we're yeah. thinking about in terms of action items. But I don't really, know, yeah. I no, think that we, confirms what my okay. instincts yeah. are on all this. Okay. I, mean, I just wanted to know if there were specific needs to change statute that are being mm -hmm. contemplated behind this discussion and because my mind goes to it's the rule that really is the place where some of those details are more appropriately okay that's helpful out, to hear that's helpful to hear I mean I think just given the onerous nature of going okay. through changing statute but maybe uh, maybe I was ignorant to something is, is why I asked no and I think I think that's part of what we wanted to hear is your guys's feedback in terms of how you view that balance because obviously Transparency is very important to us um, in terms of what we do as a board and as a state and public records acts and openness of meetings. That's also a really important concept, but I think we wanted to hear kind of just a reaction when we look at it in the context of this data. For me, at least, it, it felt a little squidgy. And I think we wanted to hear your guys' thoughts, too. So I have a few thoughts, um, and I'm not sure they're at all connected, but um, totally okay. <laughs> Not sure the, the presentation first, was either. So. The, the first is uh, like ownership of this data. As that we, you know, we're talking about a public record, but we're also talking about an individuals' personal um, medical records, procedures, experience, diagnoses. I mean, there's a lot of really personal stuff in the daycares and stuff. Is it state-owned data or is it? still owned by the person to whom that diagnosis was made or that procedure was done. And or so, Blue Cross, for example. Or yeah. <coughs> yeah, or is it the, the insurer, the payer? Um, so, I, so that's just kind of a thought, and I'm not sure how it ties into whether it be a statutory fix or a, a regulatory fix. But the other thought, um, if we tie ours to HIPAA, do, what are the recommendations around, or what has been the experience with some of the education, education data, like around FERPA protections? Mm -hmm. Are there any parallels there that could inform how you may want to strengthen um, <coughs> protections around VCARES uh, data and how we, how we respond with a request and um, request for ask, uh, access or uh, the public records request? A good question that I have not looked into. And I don't think it has any. I think it would be helpful to look into that. Yeah, it's a good idea. Yeah. It's a really good idea. So I'm happy to look into that. Yeah, and then finally, um, I'm thinking of, I can't remember if the DUA agreements 
for accessing VPRs or even the individual access or individual user access agreements, does it have that minimal cell size mm -hmm. identified? Yes, it does. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's another that is another safeguard that especially as if we think about moving potentially to an identified at least an identified stage of the VPRs if that's something that we ever want to consider, as well as the linkage, then that the linkage increases the likelihood that you would be inadvertently able to identify someone. Um, but that minimal cell size is critical. But if it's our, I, it's been a while since I've read my DUA, but if, as long as that's in there, I know it's a Medicare yes. or CMS requirement, but I don't know, I didn't know if we had extended it across all Medicaid and commercial data. Education has worked out some of those dynamics mm -hmm. and thinking about rural or smaller schools mm -hmm. and that dynamic and how that plays, I know has been addressed. I can't remember exactly okay. how they did or what the, I think it's 11 and then a larger, like a 30 size for grouping. Mm -hmm. There is something to learn there. Okay. That, thank you. That's a really useful suggestion. And um, I'm just looking at the time. Yeah, I'm I want to make sure that we have um, we have some members of the public here. I want to make sure they comment because they may. I, have some yeah, I was going to say I, I also want to hear public comment yeah. on this stuff. So, too, so. If, if the council is good or is it just, just one yeah. small yeah. idea, if you're familiar with HCUP, mm -hmm. you know, HRQ's yeah. online database, searchable kind of thing, and just as a practical option, and I know that's a whole other project to stand that up, but. People can self-service answer questions without actually getting a data file. Mm -hmm. Just get answers to their questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'll give you one quick example that amazed me is that um, having to do with uh, the conversion of the student count in education to equalize pupils, um, which is done in the AHS, and that is not public information because the because the conversion has to do with people. English is a second language mm -hmm. and, and poverty, uh, free and reduced lunch. And when you get down to a small school, yeah. you know, you can begin to kind of, you know, unwind that data and, and begin to figure out who, who who they might be. So I had a chance to ask for that data at one mm -hmm. point in time, and the education department wouldn't give it to me. In terms of kind of a fix, is that a possibility? that during a, an active data use agreement, when you have your X access to the VCURES data set, you are now precluded during that time frame from access to other data sets, mm -hmm. um, census tract data, uh, uh, you know, I'm, I can't even think of everything that could be oh, out there to yeah. prevent that. <laughs> That cobbling together, <laughs> I and where, you know, where would that coordinating point be? Um, so I know currently in our data use agreement, at least I'm fairly sure about this, and Kate can confirm that we do have a prohibition on linkage. So like part of the thing that you're agreeing to by agreeing to the data use agreement is that you're not going to attempt to link this to other databases. Um, yes, that's correct. Yeah. Okay. So well, I, it's either in the application itself um, that is the. The, the question for approval, or it's in it's written in the DNA okay. so language. I, but yeah, you cannot you cannot link data sets together unless you specifically request that, and there's a an application process for um, data linkage. And so that's obviously a concept we've been exploring too, is perhaps opening that up a little bit more, thinking about it, being more broad about that. So I think right now, as part of the like agreement that you're not going to try to re-identify this information, you also don't get to link it well, unless we know what's going on and all of that. Um, so I, I mean, I, I think, think it's in the DUI. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I think there is that piece in place, um, but, you know, I also, just generally, I don't necessarily know that you need to link it to re I mean, because this is a small state, and when we get down to county level information, we get down to, you know, town level information. When you're talking about somebody who's, you know, a town of 400, somebody who's 45, who had a broken arm a month ago because they fell off a horse, like, <laughs> not in that town or not in that county. I mean, you know, it's it's not hard in a small population to to think about that without really trying. So, 
yes, we do try to take the steps, and I don't, I don't know if that answered your question or not, but, you know. Uh, yeah, I'm just thinking yeah. in, in terms of like hard steps, there's the attestation, right. but right. Uh, you know, un another barrier that is you know, yeah. from our perspective mm -hmm. are taking away the tools mm -hmm. to even be able to try to cobble together. And I don't know enough about the technical piece of linkage to know like if there's a way that we could stop like just prevent it from being linked technically. I don't I don't know how that process happens. So that's probably a separate question. Maybe a very big question. <laughs> sure. Uh, well, I mean, I, I'm thinking of our experience with on point, and we work with multiple data sets and view cures, and um, we may see a cell size within our group who have signed the affidavits and IU, IAUs, and um, so we'll say that that's okay. That's a cell size less than 11. But when we make it public, all of those cells are blinded. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it's it's as long as it's not in the public sphere, but it's within those people who have signed all the agreements. Then seeing that maybe that one off or and that's that's an important distinction to make too. Is somewhat sometimes in the statute as well they say making it publicly available. Well, does that mean you know we release the data to anybody? Like any time we release the data, is that making it publicly available even if it's in a limited use situation for a particular user? You know, that, that's something we have to think about, too, so. Versus making it a public use file, I guess, those would be the distinctions yeah. that I would draw. I think something that you said, you know, the kind of the frequently asked questions, mm -hmm. is there a way to produce a document or access points that would, people could go to where we have the control of what's in there? And, and that's public, and here, this is okay. Um, Do you mean I in guess. terms of like the limited place level data? Or? Yeah, like is, is there a way to have enough? Um, I guess what I'm trying to also do is kind of satiate the, the need to uh -huh. request. So it would take hopefully take away some of the requests, mm -hmm. public records and requests, make controlled information, you know, this is vetted or posting publicly. But it, it, it's isn't a little the, bit out isn't there, that but the public <laughs> access file that you're talking yeah. about? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I would yeah. think those yeah. would be public use files. Right. Yeah. 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 And I think, I mean, at this point, we do not have public use files right. that we've put together for v I know we this are working is, on that. Yes, this is in process. Right. It's not yeah. that we have them available yeah. right now. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I know that is in the, the future. Mm -hmm. These are part of the plans that we are working on as far as sharing the information. So, mm -hmm. so um, I think we should open it up to public oh, yeah, comments. I, I, and I'm, I'm looking at my clock here because I have another call at 3.30. I can go over, obviously. This was my first commitment. But um, I do want to make sure the public has some time to weigh in. Does anyone from the public have any comments? So I, as we're looking at other substantive areas, I was thinking some agent, the federal regs around the public use microdata samples mm -hmm. might be somewhat useful. And IPUMS out of um, University of Minnesota, I know they, um, so it's, it's an online tool to use a microdata sample. And I get a lot of policy um, notifications from them about changes in the federal regs. And they seem to be really kind of trying to balance this issue of useful for academics versus privacy. So maybe oh. iPhones is a good thing to look at. It's also you know really me? nifty. Oh, link to that? Yes, I can. Thank Sarah you. has it, too. Oh, OK. Because <laughs> I emailed yeah, her with that link. Right. All right. <laughs> yeah, I would be curious to look at yeah, that, I'll, too. Yeah, I'll shoot that open. Anyone else for public comments? Like, yeah, I have a couple of questions. Um, one is, I would just say, I'd have to go back to the enabling statute. Um, I just would remind you, and I'm sure you're well aware that in addition to HIPAA, there are the um, 42 CFR Part 2 um, restrictions as well, and to the extent that any information is created at a Part 2 uh, mm -hmm. facility, there's additional um, requirements that are needed, so it's something to consider. Yeah. Okay. I didn't need to rush the discussion. I just wanted to make sure that there was time for the public comment. Um, so I, I would say next steps. We, uh, I mean, I know there are a couple of specific things that I was going to look into. 
and just follow up. up. And then I think um, maybe at the next meeting we could provide an update on where we are with the rule mm -hmm. and maybe see where any of this is going, any of the discussion today mm -hmm. would um, be added. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Um, I know you were going to talk about schedules, so that yeah. we probably did transition yeah. um, in terms of our yeah, plans for next week. Thank you, great. everybody. It's yeah, really it was very helpful discussion. Yeah, it was a great discussion. discussion. Really leading. Um, so, and are you going to talk about the analytics page, or are we going to put that off? That was number five, and then I, we were going to talk about upcoming meetings. I think we have to talk about upcoming <coughs> meetings and call it a day. Um, but what I had wanted to do, which is not entirely necessary for me to do, because I know that this is something that at your leisure you can do on your own, and I also provided you a little bit of a trail of breadcrumbs in your oh, yeah. um, in your packet. But I, if, if time allowed, I thought it would be fun to do a little walkthrough of the data and analytics um, web pages that we have as a subset of the Green Mountain Care Board website because there's what I think of as a wealth of information on there. And it's kind of an iter iterative process in which we um, update it and improve it. Uh, we um, make little changes as, um, as we're able as opposed to like a whole you know, relaunch of a brand new kind of website sort of thing. But um, over the last six to eight months, we have made um, a, a, a number of changes and added a lot of information on there. So um, peruse it and let me know what you think. If um, it brings up questions for you, if you think there is information that you don't see that you might like to see there, um, if anything looks conflicting or confusing um, or broken links or anything like that, just let me know. Um, but there's a, there's a section for the, the, the data governance and stewardship program under which all of the DUAs are, are linked as well as the application that's associated with that DUA because it's really in the application where you get the details about the projects. Um, and then um, in the, in the VCURES subsection, uh, we've worked on documentation. Um, there's a, a quick and easy VCURES capabilities document, like what you can do with VCURES, what you really, it's challenging to do, try to do with VCURES. Um, and there's an overview document that goes into some more detail about what VCURES is and is not. So, um, oh, and then a whole section with analytic reports that we continue to add to. So as we create um, reports and visualizations of um, data. We are posting it there. So um, please take a look. Can I put a plug in for the analytic reports to say that they're on hospital budgets at this mm -hmm. point? Um, yeah. There's an ACO, all there for cost of care, yep. um, interactive visualization. And they're they're working, working on an ACO report. one. So yep. these are yeah, stuff mm -hmm. really valuable. Mm -hmm. Is that it? Were these from the present Green Mountain Care Board presentation? Some, no, um, yeah, I think they were them? all, I know, and the expenditure analysis this, is also yeah. in there, but I think they were presented at a board meeting. Yeah, some of them. The information um, was all, has all been presented. Yeah, at but I, I yeah. do think that the visualization, the total cost of care was for sure. Yeah. And it, they really, it was excellent. Really great. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it's, a testament to um, Sarah Lindbergh and yes. the work that she's done, and Kevin Mullen, the chair of the board, who's made data a high priority. So I think it's great. Congratulations it's on the great, great work. Absolutely. And yeah. Kate O'Neill for cleaning up the VCURES website. <laughs> so I won't spend any more time on that, but, um, but just to, to wrap up this meeting, um, we have um, sort of three issues. Um, on deck for discussion at these council meetings. And um, one of them, as you know, is the rule revision. So uh, that is in progress. And this conversation is kind of a, a precursor to looking at the data release rule. And Lynn is um, queuing that up for a, um, an upcoming meeting. The other uh, 
topic area is the the FUDS data set, the hospital discharge data set. We, we mention it and it comes up from time to time, but we haven't really spent time looking at it and thinking about it and understanding it and um, talking about the issues around that. So we would like to do that at an upcoming meeting. And then the other one is around data linkage. So it came up today. Um, we would like to have a, a broader policy discussion around data linkage. Um, so what kind of linkage requests come in? What does it really mean? What are the implications of that? And um, we as staff would like uh, some guidance from the council around um, what, what's acceptable to you in terms of data linkage, what, um, um, you know, what, a direction that we might want to go in, keep, keep it really tight or, um, or loosen that up for um, more robust research, that kind of thing. So seeing that, um, we already have a meeting scheduled for August 6th, and we have, um, then the next meeting would be October 1st. We're already into October, believe it or not. But I would like to propose that we add a September meeting so that we can tackle these three topics right, you know, one right after the other and can get them moving along. Um, what I'm proposing is to add a meeting on September 10th. I would like to know if that is acceptable to I the council. I just planned a vacation that week, seriously. You did? I can, um, <laughs> well, <laughs> I literally just sent the deposit, so. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Yes, normally we it's, meet on the first yeah, Tuesday. No, it works that happens for to be the else. day after Labor yeah. Day. Yeah. But you just you tell me if September, if adding the meeting in September is acceptable so that we can get through I think we need these to, really yeah. meaty issues mm -hmm. as opposed to all of a sudden now like three topics, three meetings, we're now into December. I can delegate another chair, really. It's fine. Uh, I think it's a good time. I think the first week of September is probably it's just crazy. It's a holiday week. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, so what about the other two weeks? What other two Tuesdays? The, the, there, there's certainly a possibility. Yeah, yeah. We have another meeting October first. So oh, good. Yeah. yeah. I, I'm, fi I'm, I, I'm fine, and I can get feedback. I'm not sure we're doing it. Is adding a September meeting acceptable? And then um, yeah. can we just say that maybe September 10th is tentative, but I'll, I'll look to see if maybe I, uh, working with you I can find another meeting that works for all. I mean, a meeting time that works for all. Okay. Yeah, they are. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anything else from the council? Any other business you want to bring up or? I move to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Thank you.